Uh, and to help him ease him into this, I brought one of his good old friends along uh, to introduce him. So, uh, Robert. Oh, <laughs> old. That, that's a key word. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. It's my pleasure this morning to uh, introduce my friend, Bill Herman. Uh, Bill is going to talk to us today about creating a sustainable organization, and I was lucky enough to have a sneak preview, so uh, I think you will enjoy it. I've known Bill, I met Bill in 1982 when he first came to Ann Arbor to open up the Ann Arbor office of Plant Moran, and over the last 30 years our friendship has grown, but also my respect on his leadership and what Plant Moran has done to create and sustain organization. Uh, Bill uh, has spent 15 years on the management committee for Plant Moran. Eight of those years he was managing uh, partner. And in 2008 he successfully transitioned his uh, managing partner position to uh, uh, Gordon Crater. And uh, last year they uh, wrote a book on succession transition, a roadmap for a seamless uh, transition leadership. And if you've not had a chance to read this book, I would highly recommend it. It's a fairly quick read, but uh, you can see uh, what a great organization has done to really build uh, succession transition. Uh, from that book, Bill has involved his thoughts into really what is creates a sustaining organization. Uh, Plant Moran uh, has, over the last 50 years, has evolved this, and these are Bill's thoughts, and he has uh, continued to, uh, he continues to think about what makes a successful uh, uh, process of creating uh, a sustaining organization. The proof in the pudding, I guess, was, would be that in the last 14 years, each year, the Fortune Magazine, Magazine's Top 100 Best Places to Work, Plant Moran has been there every year. So with that, please join me in welcome Bill Herman. Thank you, Bill. Uh, the sun is through, so maybe you could be just to the... Better to the no, left. The other side yeah, of the other side, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right there is fine. Can you hear me without the mic? Yes. Good. Well, you, you might be better with the mic for the video. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. So, uh, thanks, Bob. I was expecting something not quite so nice, but uh, <laughs> well, I, 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 I believe Bob. I eliminated that. That's guy I haven't let Dan Gill introduce you yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's got other kinds of stories he yeah. tells. So, I'm a little self-conscious today because I'm going to talk about Plant Moran. And I think it's important to put a caveat on this that we are one organization. We found something that works for us. I'm going to share that to probably, hopefully not more than what you'd like to hear, but what you're going to hear. And I'd like you to recognize that there's lots of different ideas, ways, and approaches to go after things. And success is many things for many different people. If you think about success, it could be financial. It could be just the excitement of building an organization. It could be psychic income from helping others, or some combination of all those items. What I'd like to try and do, let's see if this works. Yeah. Go up. I'll, I'll work out it. I'll give you a little bit of background on the firm. And my purpose in doing this is really just to give you a little bit of perspective. There we go. So this is the firm over the last 40 years. And the reason I picked these uh, particular points in time is that they represent every change in leadership that we had over that 40 year period. We've had four managing partners. To give you an idea, in 1971, there were roughly 65, 70 people, about a $2 million organization. And over the last 40 years, we're a little better than 300 million, almost 2,000 people. And the number of offices, we went from one and now we've got uh, roughly 20 offices in uh, four different countries, uh, China, India, Mexico, and here in the States, primarily in the Midwest. The important item, I'll do this. This is what happened every time we had a change in leadership. People were focused on growing the firm, building the people, 
making changes, figuring out the best way to hand things off. And the importance of the handoff is that everybody had to have a shared vision. Everybody had to have an idea of where they were going, what they were trying to accomplish it, and how we would do it together. And the thing that's been really pretty neat for me to watch is I was a proofreader in 1971, a junior in college, and I had the opportunity to watch Frank Graham hand it off to Ed Parks. Then I got to work closely with Ed Parks as he handed off to Bill Matthews. I was the recipient, and then my opportunity to share with Gordon Crater, who's our current managing partner. When I look at the firm, we were but a, a, a dot, and today we're the 10th largest firm in the country, and I have a relatively significant presence on an international basis. Well, what you see here are the 10 steps, in my opinion, to create a sustainable organization. And it's kind of broken into a couple of categories. It starts with vision, goes to planning and strategy, creating alignment within the organization, leading and promoting change. When you look at those four elements, in my mind, that is really building the business case and building the business foundation. From there, you go to building and maintaining the organization itself, creating the environment. A lot of people call that culture. Communication. Communication is something that I think we vastly underestimate the impact that it can have. Selection of people, development of leadership, creating developmental and experiential learning experiences, mentoring and coaching, in the final phase, which is transition and succession onto new activities. I think as you look at this, if you could keep in mind that cycle of leadership that I talked about, which is grow, build, change, and hand off. Let's go to vision. This is one way of looking at vision. Frank Moran liked pictures. And his picture was, he said, I want Plant Moran to be the Mayo Clinic of accounting firms. You might say, what the heck, how does that come together? But well, the vision was this. He wanted a building that you could grow. You could go from one story to two to five to ten to a hundred. There would be two doors. One would be for the people who are going to provide service. And you want that line to be as long as you could see, and as inclusive as it could be, and as diverse as it could be. The other door would be for people that needed help, needed the services that the firm could provide. And the idea was we're going to have two lines, as long as you can see, of people that want to work here and people that want to be served by the organization. That was a vision. We have a shorthand way of getting that. The firm would say, look, we're supposed to be the Mayo Clinic. And that generally goes to somebody that maybe dropped the ball, didn't deliver the service they should. Maybe we didn't include somebody that we should have. But it's a real shorthand way of saying, this is what we're all about. This is a different vision. And what it does is it shows where we are. It says our vision is that we will be relentless in our pursuit of our commitment to growth. Note that word growth again. The importance of growth is that's what provides opportunities. Providing 100% of our clients with un unmatched service and having 100% of our staff realize professional and personal fulfillment. Pretty significant, pretty uh, altruistic but amazingly something that everybody in the firm understands and expects has come to be in a position that that's what we do. So we try to provide for each other. This build built out our pyramid. This is all part of our vision, and I'm sharing our vision just as an example of different ways you can communicate it. The vision that I just shared with you, supported by our core values. Our core values are pretty simple. Deeply committed to our client's success, guided by the golden rule, maximizing individual opportunities within the concept of a team. We've got an environment that includes our client satisfaction, commitment to people, focus on growth and innovation, and the quality of the work that we do. The tools that we use, we have a balanced scorecard. We try to go through and make sure that everybody understands strategic planning, where we're going, what our direction might be. We try to make sure that we have leadership for everybody. We put this out so that everybody can see it, and if we're falling short, they're pretty good about sharing the fact that, uh, hey, you know, you said you were going to do this, and uh, we weren't so high, so what are you going to do about it? Second step, planning, strategy. Something that I think folks may or may not spend enough time on. 
if I went to Michael Porter, whether or not he's the greatest guy in the world uh, on strategy, I don't know, but he sure has got a hell of a lot of stuff out on the internet. Because I looked at all of it, and I looked at many of the different theories that I've heard, I got to a point that I said, hell, I don't care what strategy you pick. Take anyone that appeals to you. But you sure as heck better have a strategy. You better be true to it, and you better make sure that you're consistent with it. Because if you change like the wind, you really don't have a strategy. Seems kind of commonsensical, but the reality is, things come in to change it. And the things that will come in and make you want to change is there are disruptive technologies. That isn't enough to change your strategy. And if your strategy is just based on today's technology, it's not a long-term strategy, and it's not something that is going to be sustainable if that's what you want to have. As I said, the process that you use, to me, is irrelevant. The fact that you have a process and a commitment is really the most critical issue that I think you can take a look at. This is Plant Moraine strategy. It's called the Wheel of Progress. As you can tell, it is uh, not exactly brand new. It's been around for my entire career and maybe 10 years before that. Here's how it works. We hire good staff that are capable of doing good work, which attracts good clients who are willing to pay good fees, which allows us to pay good wages to attract good staff. Start any place you want to be. You can go round and round. There's not a place where you can jump off the wheel unless you're just gonna have a flat tire. And the reality of it is, this is our strategic plan. It's been there for 50 years. We change the tactics, we address the economy, we address all the changes that take place. But the reality is, that's our core, and that's essentially what we're focused on. It has a couple of things to me that I think are, are really pretty important. It's a single iconic view, and it represents our strategy, our culture, and it reinforces our vision. Single tool. One of the things that we do that's probably a little bit different, we don't have a meeting of management or leadership that doesn't include a topic about our culture, what we're doing, how we're performing, and are we delivering on the promises that we've made. It's a standing agenda item for every meeting. It has been for about the last you know, 30 years that I've been involved with management of the firm. Next item is creating alignment. Um, I've got a, 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 a really fortunate experience. Uh, a couple years ago, I started to meet with Rob and six, seven other folks, and we started talking about different things. And one of the items that had come to my attention as I met with a number of clients is that a lot of times they seem to be going in 40 directions. And the importance of alignment really came out to me. This is a tool. It's about as simple a tool as you can have. It's a great aligner for strategic planning. And it goes like this. You get 15 points of emphasis. And the emphasis is made up of people, people you're going to hire, available time or the hours of the people that you have employed, and the dollars that you have available to invest. And there are three categories that you can invest your money in your emphasis and all the time that you've got. It's in growth, profitability, or predictability. What, we, what I found over the years is uh, people need definitions. So growth, top line, revenue. Profitability, bottom line, the profit. Predictability, everything in between. Process, customer, customer satisfaction, on-time delivery, all the measurables that you might have. The exercise is this. You look back and you look forward. Divide all those resources you have available. How would you allocate 15, one fifteenth of that into each of these categories? So you got 15 points. The rules are you can't go five by five, and no two numbers can be the same. So if you look at the arithmetic, you kind of expect an account to have some of numbers. You have to have at least six five four is the allocation. It has to be something like that. If you go through this exercise, here's the way I suggest you do it. Let's assume you've got five people on your management team or your leadership team. Ask them to do that allocation individually without conversation. I have had groups that are convinced they are so lockstep in what they're doing, they know exactly where they're going, 
they do this exercise, and what I thought was going to be a 10 minute you know, exercise turns out to be a couple hours. And the reality is, salespeople generally end up in column one, the owners end up in column two, and the folks responsible for operations end up in column three. Going through that exercise, coming to agreement, and getting aligned and understand why that sales guy thinks seven or eight units of your energy should go to sales is really important. Maybe they don't understand the fact that you don't have the systems to support what you need to do. In any event, I think you get a sense of how this type of a process can go forward. Pretty simple, but awfully effective. Second item that I'm going to show, I never came up with a title for this. We call it the entrenchment tool and we use it with our clients. And this is also something that this uh, group of old dogs came up with. And essentially, it's the oldest analytical tool, I think, in the book. Two access analysis. Flexibility, stability, internal focus, external focus. In each of these quadrants, what we're doing is if you're flexible and you're internally focused, what it creates is collaboration between departments, between people, identification of what you should be doing. If you're trying to be a more stable organization and you're internally focused, you create better process. So you have process improvement. If you're externally focused and very flexible, it's innovation. New product, new service, new discipline, new location, new whatever it might be. And if you're in a position that stability and growth is not available to you, you focus on differentiation. Better pricing, better delivery, better service, better something. Well, when I looked at this, I said, you know, there's got to be a way we can have something as simple as that prior tool. What I came up with, now you get 100 units of energy. You have to allocate it around these four quadrants. And again, it can't be equal. So I looked at Plan Moran and I said, huh, I wonder what we've done. But intuitively, we've looked at, I looked at the last 10 years that I was involved. What I found, we had a period of time where our, our, our groups were growing internally, but they weren't talking to one another. So we had to get better at that. We took about 60% of our energy and focused it internally. We did things like electronic work papers. We identified ways that people would work together. We created cross-serving opportunities and generally tried to address collaborate, collaborating with one another and creating better process. Then we got to, say, 2004 or 5, and guess what? The market was hot. We had all this stuff that we built. It worked really well. We went out and we grew like crazy. Then, the fall of 2018, and everything went to hell in a handbasket. And what did we do? We had all these wonderful services. We had all this great stuff. We had a good price. Everybody said, I'm trying to survive. Good luck with all that stuff. And what we had to do is we had to find a way to differentiate ourselves. Our differentiation was we had to reduce our prices. We had to get skinnier with the way we would approach items. And essentially, what happened is as we are coming out, have come out, we identified some process improvements over the last year, revisited our collaboration, we're back focused on growth. I'm really quite pleased that we're up about 10% this year. When I take a look at that in the market that we're in, we're basically in the Midwest and the States, it feels pretty good. But what I just did is I gave you 10 years of history at Plant Moran. If you look at your own organization, my guess is you've been in each one of these quadrants. But did you know it? Were you focused on it? This exercise, you go to the management team and you say, hey management team, again, five, six people, whatever you've got, take 100 units, allocate it into each one of these quadrants, where should we be? If I've got somebody that's here, somebody that's there, somebody that's there, we got nothing in the way of direction, we aren't aligned, we aren't going to be intentional, and we're not going to be very effective in terms of what we deliver. Creating this alignment is a huge deal. Probably something that our companies don't spend enough time on. As I told you, the first four areas we're going to talk about, vision, planning, alignment, and now change, are really the business foundation. So let's talk about change. There's a gal, and i got to look down so I can read the name, Mary Lippitt, who I believe, Rob, you told me, is from Ann Arbor, yeah. was in Ann Arbor? Yeah. I think Mary and Ron Lippitt, or it's either his daughter or his wife, but they're and the founders of organizational uh, development and businesses. This chart was really pretty uh, eye-opening to me. 
And what it does is it defines what makes change. It's a vision plus a skill set, motivation, having the resources, having an action plan, and you get change. If you eliminate any one of these items, you end up with a not so great result. So if you knock out vision, everybody's a little confused and not exactly sure where they're going. If you knock out skill set, execution suffers. You don't have motivation, people have a little bit of resistance in terms of where they're going to go forward. And if you don't have the resources, you have frustration, and finally without a plan, a bunch of false starts. So when you look at this, it really defines what you need to do. I looked at everything that I could recall that we went through and weren't very good at executing on change to the firm. And I found that nine times out of 10, we didn't allocate the needed resources. And generally that needed resource was the guy or the gal that was gonna lead the initiative. If there isn't somebody that's carrying the ball or carrying the standard, it didn't get done. And it wasn't because we didn't have a good intention, we had a good plan, but if it wasn't anybody's responsibility, it was no one's responsibility. As a result, that was our downfall. Take the organization and identify where exactly might you have a gap. And if you take a look at something that didn't go as well as you wanted, what might you have been missing? Maybe it wasn't a good idea. That happens too. Uh, as a guy who's authored just a myriad of ideas that weren't so hot, um, sometimes that's a real problem to go along with execution. <laughs> Moving on. We're moving on to creating the environment and figuring out exactly how we create the foundation for what I'll call sustainability and creating the organization as we move forward. And I think if you look at this, we have got to talk about culture. A study done a number of years, a couple hundred companies, showed that those that were well managed and had a great culture grew on average by almost 700% versus others that didn't focus on culture that only grew about 160%. We did a survey of our staff, we've done many, who've been very consistent in their response saying that Plant Brand's culture is 70% responsible for the reason they stay with the firm. The reason they joined us and the reason they stay is a big deal. Bob mentioned the Fortune Award. That, quite frankly, is an outcome. Uh, we, quite frankly, didn't even apply for the first go-round. We, we were identified and put on the list. And we were pretty surprised by it. Our staff got pretty revved up about it and identified the fact, you know what, we talk about a lot, we need to celebrate it more. We use um, a picture, if you will, and we say the firm is like an orchard. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna grow an orchard and continue to have you know, load-bearing trees out into the future. People think about apples and oranges and peaches and whatever else grows on trees, and the reality is when we got focused on it, we said, you know what we are? We're an orchard people. We're going to grow people, and one of the real responsibilities we've got is to make sure that it's sustainable and we can have that orchard continue to bear fruit as long as we possibly can. If you look at your organization, I'd like to give you a visualization. Think about being on a lake and seeing a little grouping, uh, an area where there's lily pads. You ever looked at lily pads? They're pretty nice. They look very attractive. They seem very simple. They're very placid. They sit on top of the water. You've got all the, the lily pads that are there, and you see the occasional flowers. <coughs> Lift them up and look underneath them. It's a mess. I mean, it looks like something that I would wire. I'm not particularly handy. It's very confused, it's very complex, it's twisted, it's turned. That's what your organization is. The reason is because there's people there. Outside, outwardly, they look pretty composed, Everybody's happy, you look underneath, there's a lot of churning, there's a lot of challenge. So keep that kind of in mind. Simple appearance, complex structure because people are involved. As soon as you have more and more people interacting with one another, it becomes more and more challenging. I think what you have to look at is recognizing that business culture supports some naturally ordership or orderly leadership transitions. And what helps communicate a lot of that? Well, quite frankly, a lot of it comes from stories, sharing iconic pictures, having some stability, and creating an attitude that the culture is living, and it's something that you have to deal with. I think when you take a look at it, um, we have a, an item we call spirit principles. And about a year after someone has joined the firm, we have a meeting, and at the meeting, our management team is there. It's usually about 75 or 80 people. 
what we talk about is how did we deliver on what we promised you? What do you like the best? What have we not done? What should we change? What should we make sure we don't lose? And people talk about it. And quite frankly, it is amazing to us how many times we drift. Somebody's got to kind of wrap us up the side of the head, and go back and say, okay, back to basics. We need to be in a position. Down here in the corner, you might see this uh, We Care Plant Land. Uh, that's supposed to be a golden ruler. Everybody that joins the firm gets a six inch ruler, it's fake gold, but it is a golden ruler, and it is amazing to me. When I walk around the office, probably seven out of 10 people have that sitting on their desk. And it's supposed to represent the golden rule. How are you gonna treat one another? What are you gonna do? It's a reminder. I've asked some of the people that don't have it on their desk, why don't you have it? They because I carry it in my briefcase. So everybody seems to like it. It's a great reminder, and it's another item that kind of keeps things uh, up front, in vision, it has to be focused. 100% jerk free. That is something we talk about all the time. What it means, and you might notice, or you probably can't read it, but at the bottom there's an asterisk that says, oh, well, almost, come on, nobody's perfect. The reality is, everybody has a jerky moment, and we recognize that. This is on our website, and this is something that comes up on a regular basis. We're gonna be relatively jerk free, and we're gonna abide by the golden rule. We think it's really important to be able to share those kinds of thoughts with people so that they have it as a constant reminder. The next item is another item that we take a look at, and it's the concept of optimization versus maximization. And the reality of this is, you'd expect an accounting firm, we're being counters, we're into operations, we're really concerned about profit, which leads you to maximization. The reality is, is if you're focused on maximization, you will not be a sustainable organization. And the reason you won't be is you have to invest in the future. Invest in people, process, things you do, products that you develop, services you deliver. One of the key items we talk about is the fact that we have to make sure we take part of every year's profit and plow it into something we're going to be looking at in the future. Another item we've got is colleague partnering. You might say, what's that all about? Well, accountants are kind of a grabby group. Once they've got a client, it's theirs. And what we've tried to drive home is those clients aren't yours, they're the firm's. And the best way to serve a client is you need different perspective. That might mean a mature and a younger person. It might mean a male and a female. It might mean different disciplines. It might be somebody from a big city, somebody from a small city. Any kind of combination or permutation you can come up with Focus on the client, recognize that that's what our be all end all is, and that's gonna make us successful. Next item that I think is another example of our culture is executing on a balanced portfolio. For any of you that invest, you take a look at large cap, small cap, bonds, stocks, all the different items, you try to get a balance in your portfolio. Well, the way we've treated that in our operation, we have no client, no particular discipline, no particular activity that is dominant within the firm. As soon as you depend on one item, you start to act for that one item, and it overwhelms what you're trying to do. What we've done is we've identified seven major industries that we're gonna focus on, and what we've found over the, since 2000, we have not had one industry be the best performing industry two years in a row. Everybody's had a turn, Everybody's had their opportunity. They react to the market differently. The economy drives different performances. And what it's done is it made everybody feel they were the most important cog in the machine that year. Huge impact in terms of people's psyche and recognizing the contribution that they can make. Moving on, communication. We're back to the wheel. This is probably one of the most critical items, and I'll tell you a quick story. We got our largest client the last roughly year, year and a half. It was a huge assignment. It took over a year. We competed with, quite frankly, all the major consulting firms in the US as well as the big four. And we were successful. And somebody said, wow, I didn't think you guys had that kind of depth of experience. And I didn't think you had that kind of knowledge. Man, that's really kind of an amazing situation. Well, the truth be known, the reason we got the assignment is the client had some internal issues. And so, we started in the fall of one year and weren't awarded the assignment until the fall of the next year. The reason we got the assignment is that we managed to have 
everybody that started on that proposal be there for the final proposal delivery. Every other firm had major turnover. Two or three of them, 100% turnover. That proved to me that our culture, retaining our staff, focusing on people, was a huge issue. And the client recognized it because it wasn't a six month assignment. It's an assignment that's gonna take a couple of years to get done. It was a big deal. When you take a look at communication, I think what you have to figure out is how can you be transparent? People talk about transparency a lot. They deliver on transparency, maybe not so hot. A lot of different things that I think you have to consider is as much as you want to be kind of casual and allow things to occur, you got a plan. We do an annual communication plan, and in it we identify exactly what we want people to know and understand and learn on an ongoing basis. So over the course of 12 months, we identify the communication we're going to have with the staff. We have at least a monthly communication throughout the firm on a firm-wide basis. Sometimes it's an email, sometimes it's a podcast, sometimes it's whatever the heck it might be. Always try to make it a little bit different. Quite frankly, we try to have different people deliver it so that they understand we have a management team. There isn't some guru who's sitting up there that's the one person that has all the ideas. Uh, quite frankly, one of the key elements, um, if, if I were to look at our management team, and quite frankly, a lot of clients that I work with that are successful, they're like your hand. The fingers, the thumb, those are the individual strengths for each of those people. When you look at the gaps, those are the areas that they don't work so well. When you put the management team together, you take this person's strengths, you take this person's strengths, you put them together, guess what? You got it all covered. One person can't do all that. You really need to be in a position to recognize that you need help. Uh, communication is challenging. My, uh, my first opportunity to present to a group of associates, uh, what we do is we break the firm down into groups of about 15 or 20 people, let them ask questions. My very first meeting, I've been managing partner for probably 30, 45 days. First question I got from the floor, how much money do the partners make? Like, like that. Nobody's ever asked that before. I didn't know that I really wanted to lift up the skirt and show everybody what was going on. I figured, what the heck, they should know. And we shared it. And it was like it broke down a million barriers. Here's where we are. Here's why it happens. By the way, you don't get to spend all that money because you do have to invest back in the firm. We have these things called receivables and work in process that you have to carry. On and on and on, gave them the business background of what it's all about. We're also in a position that as we take a look at uh, some of the things that goes on, you have to be able to will and be willing to share the good, the bad, and the ugly. You need to be in a position to recognize the most important, impactful interaction you have is sitting across the table at lunch, while you're working, as you're engaged with people, just say, how are things going? What's up? Our best staff developers have the least amount of personnel time of our partners in the firm. And I scratched my head forever trying to figure out how the hell did they do it? Well, what they did, you're working at a client, you're working across the table, and they ask those silly, simple little questions. How are you? How are the kids? How's your family? What's going on in your life? People that had to be formal, let's go to lunch and we'll talk about you. It's not very comfortable, it's not very natural. That casual interaction is really, really important. I'll give you an example, uh, again, going back to 2008 and 2009, it was pretty ugly. Uh, the economy was rough, people were talking about layoffs and a number of other items. We went to our staff and we said, hey guys, we're just like everybody else. We got some issues. What do you think we should do? We got suggestions for cost eliminations in the neighborhood of about two, two and a half million dollars. It eliminated so many job eliminations we would have to look at. In other words, we had costs we could cut, not people. What it did for us as we went into 2009 and 2010, we learned a lot. We said, yeah, we thought we were pretty damn good, pretty efficient. We weren't, and the staff knew it, and they told us. It also put us in a position as the economy started to turn, as our uh, clients needed something, we were one of the few firms that had the people on staff ready to go. A big deal, a very big deal. I think the next item probably is pretty, pretty obvious. 
praise prompts intimidation all the time. Finding something, somebody doing something right and telling them that is huge. It is incredibly impactful. I think the way I put it is developing um, an art of recognition, recognizing others, is really impactful in terms of what it will do. Uh, it's really easy to take a look at our firm today and say, well, you're successful because of all the people you've got. Well, the thing I have to remind our partners, act like we're a five-person firm and you see everybody every day, and the impact will be huge. Next item, leadership and selection. I think as you take a look at uh, uh, recruiting, it can't be haphazard. You gotta get the right people on the bus, or you're gonna develop and, 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 and live by a mantra that says, hire right or manage hard. If you don't hire the right people for your organization, you have a problem. One of the things that uh, you have to recognize is everybody can't look the same, act the same, have the same skill set. You need diversity. I think uh, we started a diversity council about 11 years ago, and the importance of that is it created awareness. Okay, I didn't realize I was doing this. Our goofiest diversity item is the fact that our large office is in Southfield, and a number of people would say, Southfield says we have to do this. So if you were in Southfield, that was okay. Everybody else said, that kind of stinks. But we found out that was a big diversity item, the fact that people didn't uh, have the same perspective. Clarity versus vague vision. Really an important item, and very intentionally, you have to communicate that. The personality, skill set, and personal factors of each individual person really go a long way to creating that. When I held my hands up and put them together, that's what you're trying to get to. How do you go about recruiting college kids? Well, it's a lot different than experienced hires. What we found today is that when you're taking a look at the, the college kids, what you really need to do is you need to take a look at social media, and social media, and then some more social media, because that's what they get. Um, can you flip forward, please? That's our website. That's what kids come out and see. That's what they look at. I have a much greater appreciation for Brady Hoke and a number of other people now that we are recruiting for our, our, our entry level people as freshmen and sophomore in college. I know what heck those poor guys go through trying to get that high school athlete. They're immature, they don't know exactly what they want, they just know they're the greatest things since sliced bread. In fact, that's one of the questions I think we should all contemplate in retirement. What was the greatest thing before sliced bread? When you look at an experience hires, uh, we take a look at some different items. And included in that, psychological assessment. The reality of it is that we're not looking to find people and see if they're smart. It really is, how do they fit? What are they looking for? How do they fit into the team? And a lot of times, we have to figure out how they learn new tricks, or how they unlearn old tricks that they've had for a number of years. Um, one of the key elements with experience hires, it takes time to develop trust. We've got a very open system, and we've got a lot of people that in the first six months, they say, that's got to be belonging, they don't really need that. Then they find over time, yeah, that's kind of the way we function. If it's there, we talk about it. If it's good, that's great. If it's not, get used to it, because we're going to fix it. Um, why don't we move forward on the next slide? Onboarding. Once you hire somebody, you're not done. You just started. 20% increase in productivity by getting people on board, engaged, involved, and understanding what's going on. The importance of that is really you need to be in a position that we need to retain those staff. And what we're looking at is re-recruiting. Think about what it's like to go out and recruit somebody. You're anxious, you're engaged, you're involved, you buy them lunch, you spend time, shower them with attention, shower them with attention. What happens after they're, they're there six months or six years? They're kind of like the wallpaper. Yeah, Charlie's been here a long time, that's what happens with Charlie. We try to make it an art form. And what we've done is we have really gone after making sure once people are there, if we want them, we want to be in a position they're going to stay there. We've made it such a study that we are about 50% of the turnover rate of the other professional firms around, around the country. 
that's a big deal. The cost of, uh, of replacing people, probably 150, 170 percent of pay. Those are dollars that we're able to save. Once you retain the staff, then you're in a position that uh, that, that new recruiting has been uh, been very successful. We have two things that we do that are, are really important, and we have what we call buddies and team. We break down the entire firm in groups of about eight to ten. And the whole purpose of that is with 1,700 people, you can get lost pretty quick. You got 50 people, you can get lost pretty quick. Having a small core group to get with and be together is a big deal. You flip to the next one. Re-recruiting. Think about what you would do if one of your most valuable people came in and said they were leaving. Only don't wait for them to come in. Act on it right now. Here's a quick test. Five questions that you can ask that will identify the important items here for, for re-recruiting. Number one, do you know their number one concern? Are you working to address it? Does a team member believe that their team partner, their manager, other people care about them? Do the team members have enthusiasm and passion for the work that they do? Next one, they have a good balance, both personally and professionally. Has the team member been asked what the organization can do for them? You can go through and you can answer those questions, yes, you're in great shape. Those people are going to stick around for a long time. So you might say, gee, that's pretty nice of you guys are pretty altruistic. The reality is there's a business purpose for it. And here's what it is. It's the high-touch system. These are all the investments we make that lead to higher staff morale, lower turnover, better teamwork, quite frankly, happier clients, and it puts us in a position we have a better bottom line. As part of that optimization, maximization theory, we take those dollars and reinvest it. We're still doing just fine on the bottom line, and we're keeping the people, and we're growing the firm, and it's got a sustainable cycle. There's a real business purpose to following this routine. It's pretty darn effective. Learning. I think this is probably one of the biggest challenges because there's so many different options. Uh, there's training, could be formal. There's mentoring, and there's on the job, inside the operation, experiential learning. I think the key element here is that everybody learns differently, and you need to recognize that. We do some training, as you would in classroom style, some of it's webinars. Whatever the style you can come up with, we try to have it because we found that people are in a position, they all learn differently. This is an example, uh, I think I went through this a couple years ago, it was new at the point in time. And what it does, it's a tool that we use with our staff to explain how do you develop staff relations, how do you develop client relations. And it goes something like this. You build on your technical skills, over time when you do that, you're able to communicate what you know to people. People start to recognize that, and they'll start to ask you questions. As they do, you develop a relationship. Once that relationship is in place, they find out, you know, old, old Bill over there, he did pretty good at that. I wonder if you know about this. And they go outside, what is your normal skill set? And they find out, huh, you know something else, too. All of a sudden, you're providing them insights. Those insights start to lead to being a solution provider. We found that over time, building off of technical skills, finding the answer for people, not necessarily providing it yourself, finding somebody else that might know the answer and just making an introduction. We call it being a universal advisor. We don't know all the answers, but we try to find a lot of people that are smarter than us and bring them all to bear. What that does is that leads to be you to become a solution provider. What happens is after you provide solutions for a period of time, you become an advisor. If you spend enough time with that person, you become a trusted advisor, which is kind of the pinnacle of the relationship. Accountants are really good at three things. They are great planning. They are really good at doing or executing. They're really good at checking and finding errors, especially others. And there's one thing that we really suck at, and that is reflecting. And I would suggest all of you may be the same way. Planning, doing, checking, it's it done. But reflecting allows you to improve, understand, create understanding, share, and really end up with a much better pyramid of progress. Something that you can share with people and allow you to move forward. This is the kind of tool that we use to communicate with people about the different things they need to learn and how we're going to try to help them get to those different items. Let me move forward. Um, 
performance management. It's talked about a lot. In my mind, it's pretty simple. You set goals, you measure the results, you reward behaviors, and you repeat it. We have found that we don't set a goal, you win or you lose. We talk about your at threshold, you hit goal, you exceeded your goal. All of those are good, but they're different measures, they're different achievements against your goal. The importance of getting to those kinds of items really identify that there's different ways you can be successful and you can succeed. And I think it's important that if you take a look at these kinds of items, that you address things like, what personal competencies do you need? What are the personal qualities you should maintain? What are the results measures you should get to? And what kind of goals should you set for yourself and for the organization? What it allows is that if you do this, and we do this for every person, everybody has their own roadmap. Everybody's got a different skill set and contribute in a different way. What we have found is that by taking people in their best use, best methodology, allows us as a unit to be most successful. Next thing we did is we asked a number of people, why were you successful? How did you become a partner? Here's what they talked about. When they looked at these different things, they identified some of the common goals and what we identified as a result of that discussion is that future partners early on were pushed outside their comfort zone. They were given stretch assignments. People wanted to be challenged. I think more than ever that's true today. Future partners were exposed early to partner mentors or other people that were doing the same kinds of activities and functioned as a coach for them. Somebody was there to kind of cheer them, coach them, push them. They spent a lot of quality time with somebody that was important to their career development. Next thing, in, the, in our world, let's switch to the next one, is we want to practice development, sales. Interacting with clients, interacting with other people. This is probably the most consistent item that everybody talked about as being important. Real-time feedback. Good example. If you have a meeting, it's really convenient. Generally, both of you drive from home, go to the meeting, drive back to the office, and you're in your own car, that's really efficient and effective. Meet. Ride together. Plan a few items. What are you going to cover? What should I cover? And on the way back, in the car, what did we do well? What would you have changed? What could I have done different? What could you have done different? That kind of feedback was the number one item that we were told by our most successful partners that moved on a rapid pace. That immediate feedback, sharing it, it wasn't the most efficient time, but long term, incredibly effective. Key item is that uh, there has to be a sender and a receiver at any point in time. So those young people as they're growing and those younger, uh, less developed people, they have to be open to some feedback because it's not all going to be positive. Next item, don't walk around talking about how you're busier than a one-armed paper hand. You have to have a little enthusiasm, you have to be excited. And don't dominate an individual. Let them work with multiple people. We have found that what happens is everybody has some good ideas, somebody has some bad ideas, somebody has some great skills, and some not so great. This next item kind of seems like it should make sense, and um, it's called the Pacer Theory. Y'all recognize the standard deviation? Here's the example. I want somebody to get better at something. I'm going to match them up with the greatest person we have in the firm that has that skill set. Let's think about golf. You're not a very good golfer. How about I put you with Tiger Woods? How good are you going to feel as he knocks the ball 300 yards and you dribble it off the tee? Probably not so high. So what do you try to do? You try to find somebody that's a little bit better, that's going to bring them along in a measured pace and allow them to have some reasonable progression, something that they can see and achieve and not be overwhelmed. The whole concept of Pacer Theory is that you're going to take it in small bites put yourself in a position that you get a chance to learn on a consistent basis with real-time feedback. Let's move on to the next item, mentoring and coaching. What I think you find here is that there's a lot of studies that talk about mentoring, both formal and informal, is really important. Um, it increases retention, greater job satisfaction. People that have had mentors are better than those that haven't. And I think a lot of people have identified that both with uh, females and minorities, 
there's an opportunity uh, through mentoring to end up with a pretty good situation. I'll give you a quick study, probably my favorite stu uh, story. We had a guy that came out of school, had the highest exam score in the United States on the CPA exam. He was one bright dude. He would have thought that he was a bit of a dunce when you talked to him. He had about 12 or 15 words he never got right. He didn't pronounce them right. He didn't use them right. It was really a huge problem. Well, he was too smart to not take a chance, and so he said, how about you give us permission to have nagging rights? Every time you misstate, mispronounce, just don't do it right, we're going to let you know. That won't be in front of a client, we won't embarrass you, but every time it comes out, we're going to let you know. We did that. Took about a year, year and a half, this guy turned around, he's on our management team today. If we hadn't made that investment, he hadn't given us permission to get through those kinds of items, that brilliance would have never had an opportunity to come through. That to me is a pretty serious example of what can take place. Now, mentoring is different than coaching. And if you flip the next slide, coaching is typically all about supervisory relationships, what you have to do. Mentoring is more of a relationship-based activity. <coughs> the words that I use to describe mentoring, it has to be innovative, it has to be principled, and it has to be awfully intentional. You've got to deliver some messages. Sometimes it's not real pleasant to get into it, but you have to get to it. The example of what I think is mentoring. We have a guy uh, who, very successful, without a doubt, the greatest fault finder, error finder in the history of mankind. Whatever it was, he found it. After about a year and a half, everybody said, I don't want to work with X. He's a pain in the ass. It's just more than I can deal with. So the assignment we gave him, is that every week he had to find somebody doing something right two or three times, write it down, tell the person they did something right, and then share that. If he didn't get two or three in a week, the next week he had to do six. It only took two weeks for him to get to three a week. He's very effective at it today. And he understands, I can find error, I just don't have to tell everybody. If I find somebody not doing something well, coach them into how they can fix it, don't let them know that they're not so bright. We had another guy who, quite frankly, was terrific, but his self-confidence was lower than low. And the assignment we gave him, write down every positive thing that you do. And at the end of the month, we'd like to see eight to ten things. First month, he found three. So, okay, next month, you got to find 20 because you're behind. Next month, he found 20. Some of them were stretched, but that was okay. All we were trying to do is to develop some balance in terms of his approach. We were very forthright, very upfront, and very intentional in the actions that we took. Let's take a look at the next slide and the next topic, which is transition and succession. We're getting to the end. So we built the foundation from a business perspective. We built the, I'll call it the day-to-day -day environment of where people are at. Now it's time to turn something over. Quite frankly, the most difficult thing to do is if you're a leader in a department, of a division, of the entity, of the organization, what do you do? I mean, what do you do? Not what are you in charge of, what do you need to go through and develop as criteria? What do people need to have as a skill set? What are the skills that the individual has to possess? How do, can they go through and categorize all the things that they need it's important to recognize what they don't have as well as what they do have. Then you need to go through and identify an individual plan. By the way, you don't do this a couple months before somebody's going to do a transition. When I took over as managing partner, I figured I'd be in charge for about eight years. At the end of six months, I had already identified probably about 15 people that I was going to focus on and identified the categories that they would fill, the experiences they needed to have, and basically identified the gaps that they might have and the experiences they needed to have in order to move forward. So it's a long-term process. One of the things that um, I don't think folks totally appreciated was after anybody took over a new role, about five or six months in, I asked them who their successor was. Generally the reaction was, what am I doing wrong? Is there something I can change? What would you like me to do? 
and said, you've done everything just fine. But you need to start thinking today about who's going to take your role so you can get ready for your next role. And as you get ready for your next role, I don't want you to have one person. I'd like you to have two. And the reason to have at least two, somebody might get sick, they might leave, skill set might, might, might not be the same, or the reality might be if we've got somebody else that wasn't able to develop, maybe they can be athletic and move. When you take a look, we talked about the orchard theory. The importance of the orchard theory is that it grows and continues. When you take a look at uh, what people need to be prepared for, maybe they're going into a, a well-defined situation, maybe they're going into a mess. Maybe the economy is good, maybe it's bad. Maybe you've got a mature department or company, and maybe you're in a position that uh, you've got a lot of experienced people, or maybe you've got a bunch of newbies. In any event, you need to be prepared. So let's flip to the next slide. The way to get there, talk to people. I talked about reviews, look at the timing. As I mentioned, when I was about six months in on what I thought would be an eight-year term, I pretty well had an idea of who were the candidates that I might be looking at, and I took a look every year. Identifying the metrics of what we expect to ha have happen, how we anticipate growth to occur, and identifying and leading an annual talent review was really critical. Going through and identifying, we've got folks that have got a skill set. You know what? It might not fit here, but boy, it fits over there. Being flexible enough to move. Put yourself in a position to identify who those successors may be. Next thing I, I look at is the role of the mover out. That's the guy or gal that's moving on. Most critical item here, get a pretty good idea of when it's time to move on. It will never be right for you as an individual. Because you always are going to be better than anybody else that's coming up. Why? Because you've done it. The fact that you've done it makes you better. The reality is the organization may be in a position that they need to move about. Remember, it's not about you, the leader. It's about the organization. It's not going to be perfect. I think probably the item that really drove it home to me is when I took over as managing partner, a former managing partner came into me and his comment was, the king is dead, long live the king. I didn't get it first, and then I got it. Eight years later, I really got it. But the reality is, you're not moving out. You're moving on. You're moving on to your next step. And being an ex-managing partner and having had the opportunity to look at a lot of things that really aggravated the heck out of me when I was managing partner, I now get to fix those. Quite a deal. It's actually been a lot of fun. And the guy that, I, that succeeded me, he's pretty appreciative because he doesn't have to do it. And it's really been a great learning experience. It's even been beneficial for the organization. So remember, you're not stepping out. You're moving on to your next step. Key practices on succession. Start early. Get input from a lot of other people. Create a profile that will be successful for the position. Identify the criteria. Take a look inside and outside. If you've got a strong culture, bringing someone from the outside could be a heck of a challenge. Develop transition plans, not just for the top spot, but for all the spots, and conduct an annual calendar review. I think if you have to take a look at those kinds of items, what it will tell you is that that's going to give you a pretty good set of, of uh, activities to follow in order to do a successful transition, be it within a department or the organization or really any type of size uh, entity that you're dealing with. So about a year and a half ago, Gordon and I were talking and one thing came up to another and said, you know what, this worked out pretty good. We're still friends. We're still working along with everybody. Still likes us, we think. Why don't we try to capture what we went through? When we got started, this is what we came up with. And essentially what it captures is things from a, a perspective of Plant Moran. And from our perspective, we want a sustainable organization. That was important to us. We're actually going to celebrate our 90th anniversary next year as a firm. The first 40 years was really a one or two person firm. It has grown dramatically. But this book, I had a couple of goals. One, less than a two hour read. Secondly, there better be a summary at the end of every chapter because I hate reading long chapters and not remember what the hell I read. Those are the two things I've got. I think it's fairly practical. It's a simple read. 
Uh, Bob read it and he said he understood it, so I'm pretty sure that it's pretty clear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I knew I was <laughs> um, A couple of specific items relative to leaders. Find teachable moments. Don't let anybody out prepare you. Stretch your imagination. Don't let anybody else take the blame. Give away as much credit as you possibly can. And make sure that when you deliver feedback, it's honest and quick. Some additional items? Don't hold grudges. It's pretty easy to get in and think that somebody jobbed you. Probably they didn't. I think you need to allow people to make mistakes. You need to be in a position to have their backside. Make sure that you take care of it. This is the hardest one for me. Give somebody you don't like to try. It really is hard, and they always kept surprised me. They've done a great job. You need to have alternatives. You need to be able to willing uh, to be willing to disagree and accept other people's ideas. And if you don't think they're so good, make them better. Ask a million questions. I would suspect if people were to take a look at what I did, it was asking questions that you got. I hope it's not in a question mark. You need to observe your su successors under pressure, with people, in situations. See them as the leader. See them as a colleague. Have some compassion. Make sure you protect your own life and your own balance. Take some vacations. Make sure everybody else takes their vacation. Because if they're not balanced, you're not balanced, you've got an unbalanced organization. Build your own career in a way that is sustainable. We refer to it as being athletic. And finally, do the right thing and have a lot of fun. Now, real quick, what we're going to do is run through... Oh, Jesus, we get more. Why don't we move on? I'm recognizing the time. These are the 10 items that we started out with. What happens if you don't have vision, you don't understand where you're headed or what the purpose of your organization is? If you don't have planning, you don't have clarity. You don't know what actions to take. Without alignment, you're inefficient. If you don't create change or promote change, people are going to be hesitant. They're going to be resistant to moving forward. If you don't create the environment, people aren't going to be together. You're not going to have cohesion with the group. If you don't communicate, there won't be understanding, there won't be perspective. If you don't have the right people, you're not going to have the right resources. If you don't do the training and development, you're not going to be prepared because the people won't have the skill set. If you don't spend time coaching and mentoring, they won't develop the raw material that they have within themselves to be successful. And if you aren't successful in transition, you don't have much of, uh, of a future going forward. So as we take a look at all these items, I think probably the key item that I would take a look at is recognizing the fact that all organizations are not created equally. People have different goals. Some people want to create a sustainable organization. Others are looking at a financial play, and that's fine. Be honest with yourself. Know what it is you want to go after. Focus on that. Put yourself in a position that if you understand what it is you want, you've got a much better chance of it. I've been talking probably a little longer than I anticipated, but uh, those are my thoughts. We haven't entertain any questions. Right now. sure that they have to walk someplace and go by people to have an interaction. We try to make sure that everybody, um, not that everybody is on a first name basis, everybody is in a position that you can go in, uh, everybody has an open door and ask any questions. Managing partner, I would average eight to ten people a day that would just stop in and say, hey, I saw this, what, what, what are we doing? And so that openness, I think, is probably at the core of our culture and an important item for us. It's that opportunity to be in a position that you want to know, I'm going to tell you. Now, very few things are confidential. You know, if there's personal issues, those would be, but that'd be about it. Yeah, I have a question. Um, you said you don't have much turnover, but when you do, do you tend to lose employees to clients? 
and vice versa? Get, maybe get employees from clients? I would say that uh, of the people that leave, it's, I'm, I'm not sure of the split, but 90% are women that are going to start a family, decide to stay home, and probably the majority of the others, the large majority, end up with clients. What we find is that all accountants aren't created equally. Some folks like to have a set of books that they can control, make right, be accurate. Other people have the attention span of a three-year-old and need to go to a new client every week. And so the makeup of what they do drives some of that behavior as well as the environment that they're in. Given that you have offices all around the world, what strategies do you use? Uh, that's a really good question because what we've identified is that we've got core values and we've got ideas and thoughts that we want everybody to have, but we don't expect every office to have the same personality. And a lot of the differences come from the personality. Uh, I happen to be going to St. Joe this afternoon, we've got an office there. Their culture, they all start by 7 o'clock in the morning and that office is wrapped up tighter than them about 4.30 or 5. If I were to go to our Auburn Hills office, they're more a nine o'clock start and a six o'clock finish. And things of that nature, we don't count as being a consistency. It's how do you treat one another? How do you treat clients? Um, how do you go after different activities? We do something that's uh, incredibly expensive and very, very uh, beneficial. We have a firm conference once a year and we bring everybody from around the world to be together. We spend a day, day and a half together, one day in the conference, the rest is travel, meetings, and other activities. And the whole purpose is to make sure everybody gets the same message, everybody is there to congratulate everybody else that was promoted, and try to make sure that everybody has a chance to see those people that they talk to on the phone but have never met. And so that personal interaction, that face-to-face -face activity is a big deal. Because uh, managing partner, one of my responsibilities was that I had to get to every office twice a year and that is what we do, do today. It's going to get harder and harder to do and it's going to spread some of that up front amongst our management team. But personal interaction is a big deal. Pat? Bill, the, the, the presentation really strikes me as, you know, um, the organization is, is really aware of so many things that, that are critically important to the success. My question is, is when you became managing partner, what degree of awareness do you think Plant Moran had when you started? And, and what degree of awareness of, of all the things that you shared? I'm just curious because it seems like it's, it's, it's a constant journey, you know, to always improve and make sure that everybody understands all the things you went through. Where, where did you start and you know, where did you end in terms of, of that spectrum of awareness? I would say in the last 10 or 12 years, the thing that we've become most aware of is the fact that the managing partner happens to be the person that might have the final decision, but the management team is really what delivers the leadership. It isn't a person, it's a group of people that are cohesive, aligned, and in a position that they kind of work together. You pull one string and every person you know, kind of moves in unison. It isn't perfect. A lot of this, quite frankly, we get is feedback from what we call our spirit principle day, where people have been there and they say, no, you said you were going to do this. I think it's more like this. And we go in and we address it and try to change it. Okay. Well, so much of what you've uh, talked about is, is how this is infused with so many of your the people that work there. I'm wondering, do you have a human resources staff, uh, and what do they do? if you've already got this um, culture infused in everybody in the organization? Uh, we do have an HR group, and a lot of the time that they spend is dealing with all those legal things you have to deal with, benefits, all that type. And quite frankly, the team leaders, the groups that we break down into groups of 10, they have the responsibility to deliver these kinds of messages in a small group. Um, we talked about being relatively jerk-free, and quite frankly, if we got a jerk, they're generally gone pretty quick. Because if somebody does something that's jerky, it's pointed out, you get a little bit of room. If it happens the second time, you get a reminder. About the third time, people say, we think we got an issue, let's address it, and we do. I think, oh, it was about eight or nine years ago, our number one production guy, number one guy bringing new business in, 
was the most chargeable, turned out to be a real jerk. We asked him to leave. Everybody took notice of that and they said, hmm, I guess they're serious. And we were. Generally, if we bring someone in, we do bring in lateral partners. Um, that's often because we have a gap. Uh, we've had a couple of deaths over the years. And we had a gap within a particular practice area. We went out and found what we thought was the right person. And we made sure that as a partner, they had a buddy. And we looked at their profile and tried to make sure we found somebody that matched up very closely with them and really shadowed them for an extended period of time. And they worked together until that person got up to speed and learned the culture. And so we're not um, a closed shop by any imagination. We probably hire 40 or 50 people from outside the firm every year, experienced hires. And part of that process is onboarding them, getting them engaged, and creating a level of trust for them. Because this type of an environment, I don't think is typical. And oftentimes people look at it and say, can you give me a line of bolt? I mean, is this real? And they have to experience it. We have to give them time to get up to speed on that. One of the things I mentioned, you may recall, was that uh, cycle of investment. With lower turnover, we take a lot of those dollars to make these investments. And we think on net, we yield better. But you do have to be very intentional. You take this good looking guy first. Steve? Well said. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Bill, what, you mentioned uh, with new hires, younger generation, um, that you have to be real aware of social media. Can you talk a little bit about what else you're seeing in new hires and what their needs are and performance management? Is it, do you make, is, does it make a difference for you? Yeah, performance management has been really a, a godsend for us because people come in at different levels of maturity. And um, there's a fellow, I'm trying to remember his name, and I can't think of it, but he studies the generation. And I heard him last year, and he said, uh, that, that person you're hiring off campus that's 21, 22 is probably the equivalent of what you were when you were about 12 to 13 years old. And it's not because they're not smart, they're not exposed, it's because oftentimes maybe they didn't have to work their way through school, maybe they didn't have a summer job, maybe they didn't have some of those experiences. And what you end up having to do is you have to give them time to get up to speed. We have found that people progress at different rates. Um, the, the, the thing that would be ideal is that everybody progressed on a static basis, you know, kind of like a one over one. What we have found is we have more geometric progression variations. We have some folks that start out for a few months and it's like, holy cow, I hope they can find their way home tonight. And then they take off and within six months to a year, they've gotten up to speed. We got some folks that take off like a lightning bolt and you just level out, you run out of gas. And so it's figuring out where are they within that curve and that normative total, and then figuring out how do you deal with them. Um, we have identified that matching up buddies is an important exercise. And so the new people that come in generally get someone that's got two years experience, so they know the ropes, they know some of the problems, they know a lot of the items that people are uncomfortable with, and it really allows them to share, no, I went through that too, that was a problem for me, this is what we did. And then we put them on their advisory team for the first couple of years. So they're there to bring that to life. That may modify the, um, the goals that, the, that we set for them. And it may also put them in a position, some are high achievers, and you know, I've always had A's and I got to do this. So we let them take a faster track. Other folks want to kind of feel their way, we let them do that. I'm going to ask you, there's a lot of women because they uh, often have families. What are you trying to do to make your work environment so that they can State. We have um, probably had close to half of the women go through what we call an alternative work arrangement. And so it might be that they like to work the school year, so they be off the summer when their kids are. Uh, we've had folks that have had 20 hour work schedules, 30 hour work schedules, whatever might work for them. And so trying to be as flexible as we can be. Uh, a lot of it depends on the discipline they're in. If they're in uh, our corporate finance group, uh, that isn't an option because basically deals happen when they deal and you have to go. If they're in audit or tax or some of the recurring practices, it's really relatively simple to do. 
so remote access and things of that nature and alternative work has helped with a lot and we've also created a couple of different tracks uh, generally it's 12 13 years 14 years to get to partner uh, we've got a track now that's 15 16 17 years because they're not going to get all the experiences they need in a time frame so we'll just extend it a little bit they never take advantage of those We've had uh, probably a handful of guys that have taken the, the leaves and gone with the alternative work arrangements, and I think it's worked for them. I think they feel more pressure because it's different, and not a lot of guys are doing it. And so part of that is a learning experience, and quite frankly, that's a topic that our uh, PTA committee has. It's a parenting type roping action committee. And what they've tried to do is to help them figure out um, how do you do these things and what's a reasonable and comfortable way to go about it. Bill, we're going to have to wrap up. Uh, I just want to uh, thank you very much for presenting this tremendous material. And uh, we have sent uh, slides. We will. We have slides. Is, are they sent, Stephanie? We have. Okay, we'll send them out. And I uh, want to thank Roger for videotaping. And this should be out uh, usually within a week or so, Roger, uh, on uh, the website. So we'll send that out. Uh, we're out with a link with Dr. Rob's one day tips, which we yours uh, the last few weeks, which is I thank you for. And I want to thank our sponsors. We have a good turnout today from the United Bank and Trust. So thank them for being a sponsor. They actually, they've applied all of these principles uh, every day, right, Bob? Every day. Every day. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, it's, it's not, a, not a joke because Bob and Bill are friends, and I know Bill has... Uh, been very kind to mentor several of the people in the United Bank uh, to help them apply some of these principles. And uh, I, I think one of the other sponsors that I want to recognize is uh, is Zinger. And uh, I don't know if Mandy's here. She's usually the representative. I think she's setting up out there. But uh, Zingerman's has been one of our sponsors over many years. I want to also announce that uh, our next session is going to be bumped back to June. So I'll send you out the next date for that. And I'm putting together a program for next year that's pretty exciting. If any of you uh, would like to present or you know people that I, I should consider, uh, please let me know so that we can keep the series going and uh, have excellent presenters like, like Bill Berman. So uh, let's give Bill a big hand. Just real quick, are there any announcements, any more announcements, Stephanie? Um, I just have a really quick announcement. I'm on Team Cancer for Relay for Life, which is the largest fundraising event for American Cancer Society, which is something that has touched, I'm sure, many of your lives as well as my family's, um, which is why I do Relay for Life. Um, if anyone would like to make a donation for it, the event is actually in May, please stop by and see me. I can email you the um, link where you can actually go on the website to make a donation as well um, to our team to help support um, cancer research. Uh, I'm Ken Fisher, president of UMS. We're a performing arts presenting organization at the University of Michigan. Smart people, 100 years ago, created Hill Auditorium, uh, a place that artists around the world think is one of the top five performing venues. We're going to announce next year's season this Sunday, but it's going to be a very special year. And like we have a big house for athletics, and we know what that's been able to do for us, it's just amazing what the big house for the arts has been able to do to attract the greatest artists in the world that come to this town. So check out our website, ums.org, Sunday. Get your tickets now. Ken <laughs> is standing up, and uh, I, I want to uh, thank Ken, because he and I have been working on a, a little special project, and uh, it will be rolled out next Saturday, I think, because one of our members of CO Connect, one of the presenters, uh, Dick Sarns, who has been one of the premier entrepreneurs in Ann Arbor for 60 years is going to be receiving a honorary doctorate. Bill Sarnes, with all his, Dick Sarnes, with all his uh, glory, has never graduated from college. So uh, Ken and I were picking this up a few months ago, six months, or maybe a year ago, really, yeah. and Ken drove it through the university, and so uh, Dick's going to be receiving that. So when he gets up there next Saturday, everybody give him a great cheer. That's a big event. Uh, anybody else? I know there's a couple people searching. Chip, you're uh, you're not searching, but looking for new opportunities in terms of. Uh, if you want to just say what you're doing, and uh, just go ahead and say your name and 
My name is Chip Bialdak. I work, uh, been working in quick service restaurants for quite a few years. Worked for Domino's for a number of years, and I work out in California for Del Taco. And been trying to maybe transition um, and really think about what I do, which made a career out of going in and kind of figuring out what's going on with people, systems, processes, um, and then coming up with solutions with their problems or better ways to do things to make them better, and then getting them implemented. So I think some pretty transferable skills, and I'm trying to figure out maybe instead of QSR, especially that long commute to California that I make most every week now, um, what else could I be doing? So uh, that's right. Okay. Thank you. And uh, I know there's a number of people from the bank in terms of uh, Mike and uh, Dave, and maybe, how you guys do? You got your money to lend these days? What's going on? Mike, you want to stand up? <laughs> He's got it in his wallet. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, uh, Mike Chavis, United Bank and Trust. Stand up, Mike. Okay. I am standing up. Oh, you are standing up. That's <laughs> Joe Williams, Joe. I head up our structured finance group, and uh, we do a lot of investment nice game. And actually, one of the big things is uh, we help to finance the transition of business owners from, you know, someone who's been working in an organization for a while, now they're looking to buy it out, the owner's looking to retire. So uh, we do a lot of government guarantee loans. And um, yes, we do have money to lend. Okay. We did, I think, 30 million uh, last year, last fiscal year, so third largest SBA lender in the state. Okay, Any other from uh, United, any announcements as we debate? We got lots of money to lend, and we are lending it. A lot of this conversation about yeah. banks aren't lending or have been lending, never closed our lending window. And we've got some uh, aggressive goals that we do want to put the dollars out and we'd see them back here in our community. So uh, that's conventional lending, that's SBA lending, that's mortgage lending, consumer lending. We are number one business. mortgage lender in the Absolutely. All right, well, I think we need to respect everybody's time. You have to be able to get back to the house. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, so uh, we'll see you in June. Uh, Scott Moore, who's a professor at the uh, Business School, Law School of Business, will be presenting uh, his work, his research, and uh, then we'll uh, hopefully have the announcement of our, not our 150th, our 15th CEO. <coughs> of the CEO uh, see you all next month. In June. Bill, did you bring books if people want to buy? Uh, uh, they're into the uh, Amazon. Yeah, we have Amazon. Amazon. <laughs> <laughs>